Hello, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon. You're going to get to meet some of our leaders from Convergence today. I'm Kathy Group. I'm with the Hand Weavers Guilds of America, and we've got Mary Berry here today, Donna Foley, Tasha Griffith, Alana Wilcox, Jessica McDonald, and Angela Schneider. If you're not familiar with Convergence, these folks are all going to be leaders at Convergence. It's a seven-day fiber art conference. It starts July the 15th, goes through the 21st. Um, it has a variety of activities that will be going on. Everything from a marketplace, you can go check out that loom you've been thinking about, exhibits, fashion show, keynote speaker, tours, and so much more. And our classes are everything from a 90-minute seminar to a three-hour super seminar, all the way to a one or two, three-day workshop. It's up to you what you would like to take. Now, if you take the CVP, remember you get 25% off of your classes. And also just a reminder, if you are gonna take a class, you'll need to uh, have a membership. Today, we're gonna start with Mary Berry. Mary's gonna do a class at Convergence called Rug Hooking with Yarn and Fabric. This is a one day workshop. It will be July the 15th on a Friday. Hi, Mary. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So today, um, I guess we're gonna talk about rug hooking. I, this, is, this class is for the beginner uh, up to the experienced rug hooker. Um, there is so much in rug hooking that I know that uh, even an experienced rug hooker will, uh, will pick up something, but I'll be there with all the equipment I bring, uh, lots of different fun things to play with and to put in your piece. We're going to work on 16 by 16 square pieces. You'll work on it a piece apart at a time. I'll bring hooks. I'll bring yarn. I'll bring... Um, cut strips because we use cut wool strips and rug hooking. And really what I wanna say is first, I want you to look at this picture. This is the one that um, was used in the intro, but this is my quintessential rug hooking picture. Now, not everybody is into whimsy as much as I am, but I want you to notice how this brings so many different crafts together. Um, I've got lots of fun dyed wool strips. You can intersperse yarn in. This is some of my hand spun wool to give you lots of texture. If you look down here at some of these circles on these sheep, they are, they are novelty yarns. They are basically anything you can get your hands on. I've been known to say that I will hook it into a wall hanging. Uh, I will hook anything I can get my hands onto uh, in a, a wall hanging. This is some couched on uh, alpaca that I dyed green. Um, there's just a lot of expression in this, in this picture, um, a lot of ways to express yourself that is, it's almost like painting. I want to say uh, that it's kind of like painting with wool. Um, and we do, and I say wool because we use mostly wool, but honestly, if you're going to do a wall hanging, you can use anything you want to. Um, you can bring in any other kind of fiber that you might wanna bring in. So I'm also gonna ask my students, hey, look around. If you're making a wall hanging or say a sofa pillow, what would you like to have in it? Um, what colors are in your house? What ribbons and bits of, of hand spun and other pieces do you have hanging around that you would like to incorporate into a wall hanging or uh, a pillow or something like that? So um, it's a great lot of fun. It's a no stress class because you're following your own design uh, ideas. I bring lots of different patterns for you to choose from. I'm hoping I'll have something for everybody. And I guess that's all about rug hooking. It's just a lot of fun and very creative and um, not stressful, not rule bound, not all straight and um, straight and up and down and sideways like weaving is, for example. Um, and I have, a, I have a question for you. 
Sure. So if um, it's a one day class and somebody wants to know how far along on a project will they get? Will they finish it or is it something they'll take home and finish? It's kind of, it kind of depends on the person and it right. depends on the level of detail. But um, if you don't finish it, it's something that you can put in um, an embroidery hoop and get a rug hook um, and finish at home. I always, particularly when you've started using my wool and you've got, let's say you've got a certain place that the background is going to is a certain color I let you take the rest of that home with you so well, that you can generous. finish it that's yes. generous of you well I know what it's like to try and match <laughs> wool and and match yarn somewhere else with something you have at home so bring the things you love we'll incorporate those into your picture I will bring everything including the kitchen sink um, lots of different colors <laughs> lots of different mediums and if you don't finish in the day, it's, there's a very good chance you will finish, but you could at least finish the main motif and only have to work on the background. And you may decide not to have a background. That's very popular nowadays, just to have the main motif and, and just, it's on Scottish linen. And so the background is very presentable. Um, and then- now One thing I like about your class is that if somebody is brand spanky new, they don't really have to invest a lot. They can take right. your class and then decide if, you know, yes. if this is for me or not. It sounds yes. great. Yes, I bring I bring the equipment. I drive a pickup full of stuff. <laughs> now you don't have to have a pattern. You're going to have the pattern. I will have patterns that okay. you can choose from. Okay, good. I always chose the pattern that's like impossible to do. So I would feel good knowing you're giving me a pattern that's not going to be too hard for me. So absolutely. Well, Mary, it sounds like a wonderful class. Uh, if you want more information, you can see Mary Berry in our registration book and contact her. And again, this is rug hooking with yarn and our fabric. And it will be Sunday, I mean, Friday, July 15th. It's a one day workshop. You can check her out. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Next up, we have Donna Foley. Donna's going to talk about her class, which is weft faced weaves on your rigid heddle loom. This is a one day workshop. It's Friday the 15th. Hey, Donna, welcome back. Hi there. I am hoping I can be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my internet is being kind of funky today. Uh oh, um, I don't know. Can you see me? You're great. Oh, okay. For some reason. Okay. Well, I'm hoping that because I can't really see my screen for some reason. Well, I'll tell you anything that's going wrong. How's that? Okay, sounds good. All right. So, um, yes, I'm a weft-faced weaver, meaning for many people that would be considered a rug weave, um, but we can do it on a rigid heddle loom. It really expands the, uh, the different things you can do on a rigid, a rigid heddle loom, and it gives a whole nother look. Uh, if you've been mainly weaving, you know, scarves, uh, or wearable kind of thing. Um, these are really sturdy uh, materials that you weave that great for handbags, um, runners, pillows, um, you know, sky's the limit. <laughs> um, and so what it really actually is a color weave effect. Um, and because it's wet, wet face means that you do not see your warp at all. So here somewhere, here's a good one. You know, my warp is white and yet you do not see in the body of the weaving, the warp at all. Um, the the uh, warping process goes really fast. We'll be doing the direct warping method, but at five ends per inch. So it really doesn't take that long to warp it up. It does mean that the weaving goes a bit slower, but it, you get so involved because every single little pass that you make um, really impacts your weaving. Um, so we'll be doing um, paladors, sometimes called wolf's teeth, wavy lines. Uh, combinations of those can you know, create all kinds of this tiny little motifs running across. We'll do... Um, uh, clasped weft, which is a very tapestry-like 
um, look to things, but it, it doesn't actually get right into the meat of tapestry. And um, we'll, I'm asking people to bring a pickup stick. We'll do a little bit with the pickup stick to do these kind of bolder designs uh, that are really cool to inter, you know, work in with the color and meat. Uh, effects that we'll be doing. So it's a beginner class right on through to novice and more. There's always um, so much you can learn. It's really fun to see what everyone else is doing on their looms. Um, oh. The other thing to remind people about, and I know that a rigid head loom is one of the, the lovely things about it is it's so portable. You know, you can put it in a bag and some planes you can even carry it on and it's no big deal. But if you're traveling and you don't have access to a, a loom and you can't bring one, just a reminder, you can rent looms. And uh, so if you're thinking about taking that class and you're not real sure, um, because how long would it take to warp up a rigid head loom? Like it's, it's a one day class we're taking. So we'll be warping it. You don't have to, you're, we're gonna warp it in class. So. Oh, well, there you go. There you, you can go. rent a loom. Um, I think the warping will take about an hour, maybe. Oh, okay. People, but five ends per inch, it goes fast. Um, and the direct warping thing, um, I do have a few little tips on, because it's considered a rug weave and there are just some things that are uh, just good to know uh, how to wind on, tie on, and uh, you know, uh, passing the shuttle back and forth. There are some rug weaving tips that would, you know, you bring to your big loom. If you have a big loom at home, but just want to bring your rigid heddle, you will find many things uh, to translate to a bigger loom, but um, you can just stick with the rigid heddle too. <laughs> or yeah, them. These are all actually good. I, I did just say for rigid heddle, but you can take these Many of these things are the beginning part of tapestry. Many of these little motifs in tapestry might not run the full width of your warp, but they're definitely used. So it's a really good intro if you think tapestry might be in your future. But if you just want to stick with um, these weft waist weaves, it, it, it'll take you a lifetime before you explore it all, <laughs> really. Well, thank you so much, Donna. I appreciate you being on today. This sounds like a, another great class if you're trying to decide if this is something you want to do. So thank you so much. Again, it's weft, weft faced weaves on your rigid head of loom. It's a one day workshop. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Next up, we have Tasha. Tasha Griffith is gonna do Make Your Mark, Stitch, Mending and Embellishing. It's a three day workshop, Tuesday through Thursday. July 19th through the 21st. Hello, Tasha. Hello, Kathy. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Great. I will share my screen here. Perfect. So yeah, this is um, this workshop is all about hand stitching and all the things that that kind of means and can be part of our expression as fiber artists. So um, the first way I think about that is Stitching is finishing. So if you have a beautiful hand woven piece that you wanna add some really nice hand done hem stitching to, um, or if you're making something, a beautiful tailored garment, you wanna add some buttonhole stitch by hand, we'll go over that. Um, and we'll also talk about adding a little bit of stitching to something like say you have a, um, something you felted that just needs a little bit of, of extra, extra something to bring it to life. Um, we'll work on that. And the second thing that I think about as part of this workshop is like stitching as care, which is the mending part. And um, I mean care as care for each other, for our friends and family, um, whose garments we might or might not want to mend, or maybe we want to show them, um, show them a little mending afterwards. Um, and also care for, of course, the pieces themselves. And this is one way to extend the life of the handmade garments and textiles that we work so hard on is to, to add some stitching and mending. And this, um, this example here is from my friend Liz Spear and her friend um, Karen Swing did the, the stitching on Liz's jacket with a lot of her handwoven scraps there. Um, this is a sweater that my friend Lauren had spun and knit for 
um, for her husband and then it had some um, an unfortunate encounter with some moths and uh, I was able to go through and fix it and then that's the, the finished water kind of restored to life and then um, another big reason for me that I'm into mending and stitching is care for the environment and thinking about the impact that that our textiles have and um, keeping them going as long as possible. And as part of my own, uh, my own creative practice, I've adopted a few, a few garments, including these uh, hand knit socks that I didn't knit, but I, they were a gift. Um, and I am gonna keep mending them until I can't mend them anymore. That's kind of the project. So this is from 2012 until last fall, same socks. I've learned a lot during that time and I will definitely definitely share a lot of things that I've learned about um, about mending and how to make uh, you know how to make it make a lasting mend and also make it beautiful and visible or not as you choose um, during the workshop. And then the last reason we might want to practice some hand stitching is just as an expression of itself and to add another layer of beauty and interest to our textiles. Um, so this, you can do this on knits. This is a hat that I knit, the simple embroidery design. Um, this is another, a coat that I worked on again with Liz and she will also be at Convergence as a, um, as a vendor, um, Liz Spear. And so this is all her hand woven fabric and then some felt, Nuna felt that she had made that I helped her dye and she put the coat together. And then I added just some um, pretty simple stitching as far as execution, but just thinking about sign and texture and rhythm that just added that much, little bit more to this really special coat. And that was the back. And then this is, I just finished this um, as a little like stitching as storytelling piece for North House Folk School, which is another one of my favorite places. And um, yeah, using all, these are all naturally dyed hand dyed fabrics and threads and um, using them to tell a little story about dyeing fabric on the North Shore where North House is. So all of these things I think are just um, really great reasons to add some hand stitching to your textile skills. Well, I have to ask the question, if I if I may jump in here, that I always ask, which is, I'm not really what, great at sewing. How much skill do you have to have to understand what to do here? <laughs> oh no, I mean, great question. And this is um, this workshop is definitely open to everyone, and I totally understand that there's a lot of um, fiber artists out there that don't. I did start from sewing. That's kind of one of the first things I learned um, as a kid, but I know that that's not the case for everybody and that is totally fine. And a lot, um, a lot of the stitching that I love is really simple. Just even just like, I'm still kind of in love with running stitch and just how it looks and how it kind of visually conveys just the idea of stitching and of, um, and of handmade cloth. And like, if I, if I went back to um, the shirt that Karen worked on, like this is all running stitch and it's not all super even. It's just a lot of time and a lot of patience and it just comes out great. And so, I, yeah, I would really encourage everybody, no matter what you feel like your skill is, um, to jump in and try. And we'll also, I'll teach you a bunch of the um, embroidery stitches like I was showing in the last slide, and none of those, none of those are too hard either. Well, thank you so much. This looks great. I just, I had no idea that the um, expansion, <laughs> expansive nature of doing this. It's beautiful. Thank you, Tasha. And again, thank this you. is Make Your Mark Stitching, Mending, and Embellishing, a three-day workshop Tuesday through Thursday at Convergence. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you. Next is Alana Wilcox. Alana's going to do 12 plus ways to spin painted top for color. This is a two-day workshop. It's Tuesday and Wednesday. Hello, Alana. Hello, hello. 
So I'm going to go ahead and um, switch my screen over so you can see over here. All right. Wonderful. So hello, everybody. Um, today, I'm just going to do a real quick um, kind of who, what, where, when, why. So you already know the where, right? And you already, and you already know the when. Um, so I'm just going to cover the who, the what, and the why. Um, so basically, this workshop that I'm going to be teaching is called the 12 plus ways to spin painted top. And the who that it's for, right, are people that are color lovers, okay? So I'm a color lover. Um, I love spinning for that. But also, um, it's going to be for people that maybe aren't quite sure about how to approach working with colors so that you get mud, right? Like, we don't, we don't want to take those beautiful dyed tops and rovings that we see all of the vendors that are going to have for us and, you know, quote unquote, ruin it, right? So I'm going to come in and show you all of these different techniques and ways to approach spinning for color so that you get these awesome outcomes. Um, so as far as the skill level goes, it's really geared towards an intermediate spinner. And so what do I mean by that? That's somebody that knows how to spin a continuous yarn. It doesn't necessarily have to be consistent, but just continuous and be comfortable with your, with your tools. So you can be a drop spindler, you can be an electric spinner, a wheel spinner. I'm gonna bring my e-spinner. So all types of spinners are welcome. And it's also for anyone that does stuff with their yarn. So you could be a knitter, a crocheter, a weaver, whatever um, fabric construction type person you are, you're, you're also um, welcome to come. But it is gonna be about um, you know, the intermediate skill level as far as the techniques that I'm gonna share. So you should be comfortable with, with spinning a continuous yarn. All right. So now the other part of the who is like, who am I and, and why am I teaching this, right? So um, again, like my name is Alana Wilcox, but I'm also a master spinner. And so what that means is that I went through this spinning certificate program where I learned all the um, facets of, of spinning. And one of the things that I did in this program, right, was an in-depth study. And so what that means is that I had to pick a topic and explore it in coming up with over 20 different samples on my topic and these finished products. And one of the things that fascinated me even before doing the, the coursework was color. So of course, this is the thing that I pursued in trying to learn more about and experimenting with. And so the result of that coursework is this book that I wrote that's called A New Spin on Color. And so the scarf that you're seeing on the left is basically what inspired the book and what inspired the study and also what inspired the workshop. So I just went off and I took the same um, dye top and I spun in all of these different ways and I got all of these different um, color combinations from it and I found that that exercise was so helpful in really understanding how what I do as a spinner influences the color outcomes. And so this is probably one of my favorite workshops to teach because not only am I gonna cover the actual techniques, right? So as far as the what goes, I'm gonna be covering things like um, different fiber preparations. So even though we're starting with fiber that's already dyed, there are different ways that we can manipulate the fiber to get different color outcomes. I'm gonna also be covering spinning techniques techniques as well as plying techniques. So really going to cover kind of like all facets of, of spinning and also part of the what continued. Um, I'm hoping that when you know you leave the workshop, you're going to feel really confident with color theory and how it applies to both fiber and your spinning. So if you're not really sure you know, what color combinations work well together, or again, how to avoid getting that mud, then you will be um, really confident by the end of the workshop. And also just to have you thinking about as you, as you leave the workshop, right, what are the things that you can do as a spinner that will really get what you're envisioning in your head to look like what what it actually looks like, right? Because sometimes we can spin up these beautiful dyed braids and the results might be pretty, but it, it wasn't quite what we thought or were hoping to get. So I'm gonna really help you um, kind of start off almost with the, the end product, right? So if you have this beautiful shawl in mind, how can you get those colors to appear in the shawl very successfully even before you start spinning? And the best part about it is that you don't have to use any of your precious fiber. I will be bringing kits so you can play with my fiber and then go ahead and jump into your stash. And so the why is so that you can get results like these. So I'm going to switch back over to my other camera just to show you um, a couple of things too here. Okay. So just so you can see it a little bit better. 
over here, this is the, um, the scarf, right? So you can see there's all of these different knitting techniques, but also it's all of these different yarns that I spun. And they were all from the same dye top. So I got all of these different color combinations. And you can see they, they kind of match my wall, right? I'm a fan of um, the green and red, but this is, this is what inspired it. And also, I just thought it was kind of cool to show you, depending upon if you're a knitter, a weaver, or um, a crocheter, and even an embroiderer or needle pointer, um, this is the same top, right, that was spun up the same, but for different end uses. So for example, like over here, let's see if it's going to show up. Okay, so like over here, this is how the same top looked like when it was woven. This is how it looked like when it was knitted. Wait, this way, okay, crocheted. And then over here, that was um, needle point. So I just think it's really cool, not only how what we do as a spinner influences the, the color outcomes, but also to think about how we're gonna plan for it in a project. And I'm gonna cover that as well. So there it is. Way to go. And just to remind folks, if you want to know more about Alana, her work, um, she was a guest on Textiles and Tea back on November the 16th. If you want to go back to Facebook and watch, it was a wonderful interview and Alana did a lovely job and you learn more about her approach to spinning and, and her classes. So, you know, if you want to know more about her, there she is. Uh, 12 plus ways to spin painted top for color two day workshop. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. Next is Jessica McDonald. Jessica's doing hand manipulated lace techniques. And that is a one day workshop and it's Sunday, July 17. Hello, Jessica. Oh. Hi there. <laughs> can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. I apologize. Um, I had video issues right before our session here. So uh, although you can't see my face, you can see my body there at the loom. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Jessica McDonald. Um, and this is actually my first time going to be teaching at Convergence, which I'm very excited about. Um, I actually, back in 2018, when we had our last Convergence, I interned there for uh, the first time, and that was exciting. So um, my first experience at Convergence was in 2016 at Milwaukee, and I am addicted and can't leave. So <laughs> I'm super excited to be teaching my first class with the uh, with you guys. Um, so I am teaching on um, July 17th, the hand manipulated, hand manipulated lace techniques. Um, and what does that even mean? Um, you can see here in the photo I have of my lovely messy studio um, that hand manipulation is uh, going and putting your hands inside the warp. And I know as weavers, some people go, ah, don't do that. Um, but I do it and I break rules and we're okay. So um, so here uh, you can see, I kind of have my hands going in and out of the threads uh, to create some shapes. So I, I really love um, transparency and and open spaces and lace. And I, I use that a lot in my work. Um, so we're going to really be learning how to do the basics of those things. Um, but uh, I always get asked what's the difference between hand, man hand manipulation and loom manipulation. Um, we're not relying on the treadles and shafts and harnesses to, to make these shapes and these, these lacy bits. We're actually doing it um, on a plain weave cloth, a base. Um, and we're adding these little bits and and things in um, to uh, to create the, the laziness uh, effect. So let me just make this bigger. So right here, you can actually see me getting in there with the, I lost my crochet hook at the time. So I use my uh, heddle hook, but it works just as well. So um, and you can actually kind of see through the top of the warp, you can uh, see the laziness underneath that a part I've already woven. So um, we're going to be doing a little bit of the basics and those basics um, mean things like um, lino lace so lino uh, there's different sizes of lino so we'll go through uh, what the different types are. Um, the Danish medallion, which is what i'm doing here creating these uh, fun little bubbles uh, around some plain weave. Uh, Brooks bouquet, uh, which are lovely little bundles, um, and 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 more. There's I actually kind of create my own while I'm on the loom. So uh, we're gonna do some playing around. So here's just uh, a picture of that piece once it was off the loom. 
Um, so again, I, I love being able to see through that, but um, there's some different things happening. And so all the little knots and, and bundles are made by getting our hands in there and uh, playing around with the warp. Um, I started doing this kind of work back in my uh, first year studies in textiles, uh, and I made these giant curtains, which took forever. <laughs> uh, we won't do that. Uh, we're going to leave with a little sampler that's about six to eight inches uh, wide by as honestly as much as we can weave that day, um, this one day workshop. Um, on this piece particular, uh, this is a combination of loom manipulated uh, lace techniques um, and the hand manipulated. So I just, I'm just showing you guys a combo, but we're focusing on those little bundles that you can see there that are, are, are wrapped. Um, with lace, um, there's, there's different ways that you can use this in your work. Um, so I've shown you, you know, some of the bigger pieces that I've done, the curtains, but we're going to leave it something smaller, kind of like this. Um, but I like to play with uh, just color on color. So black on black, white on white, but then even introducing another color or more texture. And so these are all little samples of ones I've created, uh, um, gosh, a few years ago now, but they're like little they're little tiny pieces that are quite precious and, and the lace gives it, um, I don't know, it elevates it a bit, but really it's just on a plain cloth. So as long as you can weave plain weave, which I think a lot of weavers can out there, um, and you can read a draft for plain weave, um, you can really show up with a two shaft loom, a four shaft loom or a rigid heddle. Um, and we are gonna be using um, probably a three, two mercerized or a four, eight. Now I'm Canadian, so I say four, eight, maybe you guys say eight, four, um, but uh, not a super thin weight because you're getting in there moving some threads around, you don't want any breakage. Uh, so we'll be talking about that as well in the class. And here's just a little close up of uh, some knots that are made, little shots of color just to kind of break up those sections. Um, some Danish medallion at the bottom, which is those loops that are going around in the white. And at the top there, the little bouquets, they look like little bouquets of flower. The flowers, those are the Brooks bouquets that we're gonna play around with. And then we're gonna explore, once we do the basics of those four types, we're gonna play around with how do you combine them um, in this piece. So here I have some lino, but I actually have a little bit of uh, plain weave woven on top. So uh, it might look complicated, but it's not. So um, I think what's fun is how we can combine these together to make more um, modern or playful kind of uh, pieces. Um, in this piece here, I actually took Connie, um, I believe it was Connie Lippert's class in wedge weaving uh, at Peters Valley years ago. And I was weaving and I just stopped and interjected a little lino. So um, I'm gonna show people how to just do this in sections because up until this point I've showed people, you know, my images are right across, you know, but there's ways where you can kind of pop these little beauties of uh, lace weave into the piece. So we're gonna do that. And here's just another example of that. Um, here's a, uh, a, lace weave piece, well, transparency weave piece, what I call it. I took the class a few years ago in Nevada, um, but I, I incorporated it into this piece where there's a block of lino. You can see they're just woven, uh, but then I continue doing other things. So um, I think I get a lot of questions when I teach this, like how do you single it out? Um, so we'll be talking how to break that up with different um, one or two shuttles um, and, and getting in there to make some shapes. This is amazing. I can't wait to see oh. <laughs> what you do in class at, at Convergence. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, thank you so much. I and appreciate this. Oh, good. I'm so happy. <laughs> okay. Um, I and, this is, and I also think this is a weave that people need to see to understand. Yes. And so visuals, you know, are hard, but like getting in the loom, like getting your fingers in there and yeah. Moving around this will, like be, this will be great for people I think when people think lace they think knitting so yes. this is great thank you so much for showing us this and explaining it I think this will get people really excited about your class oh, but I mean you. how could they not be already I um, hope well <laughs> I hope they are I'm excited so this, this is hand manipulated lace techniques it's a one-day workshop it's uh, Sunday July 17th Jessica McDonald thanks again Jessica no problem thank you Next up, Angela Schneider, quill spinning 
Quill Spindle Spinning. It's a 90 minute seminar. It is Saturday, July the 16th. Hey, Angela. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for inviting us all to come talk about the classes. Every one of these looks like it would be a good one to take. They all look fun. Um, but if you're- We wanna take care of our spinners. So what you got yes, for us, Angela? Absolutely. So with the Quill Spindle Spinning, uh, since I, almost since i've been spinning on a wheel i've been doing demonstrations out in public and the question you get and if you spin in public you probably have heard this where did sleeping beauty prick her finger and when you're sitting there at a wheel a modern That's wheel with that, to know. <laughs> yeah you're sitting there with the flyer and bobbin and it's kind of hard to answer the question because the offending part isn't there so pretty early on i decided you know i would my the spinning wheel I have has a, a quill spindle accessory you can get for it, so I thought I'd try it and learn how to use it just so that I could use it at demos and answer that question. Much to my surprise, once I started using it, I loved spinning on it so much that I spun exclusively on the spindle, I think, for over a year before I had a project that I went back to the flyer and bobbin. But I don't have a, anything to share on video. Instead, I've got live right here. There's the wheel with the quill spindle on it. You see, there's no moving parts. It's just the, the spindle itself. I've got some brown yarn that's wrapped around here and I've just switched to white. You can see how I've got the yarn spiraled up to the tip of the spindle. And when you start spinning, of course, the first thing it does is unwind. You just draft back that. And the yarn just pulls right out of your fiber supply. How easy is that? And this is just one type of drafting you can do on the quill spindle. And all I'm doing is reversing the wheel a little bit so that I can back up and wind on and start again. And it's got this really nice rhythm to it as you're, you're drafting and then there's that little reversal and you wind on and you keep going. And the nice thing about this kind of spinning is you see with there's since there's no differential in the speed there's no break the wheel actually has no take up on it at all it's completely controlled by the spinner which means it's really good that plus the the rather small whirl and the fast speed that you've got it's good for things like cotton this is cotton sliver and if you're like me, when you've learned to spin cotton, you found it's a little bit harder than wool because it's so short and fine. But when I got my quill spindle, I have to treadle a little faster. That's cotton. And you see how easy it's just flowing out of my hand. That's so once amazing. I learned it. Once I learned to spin cotton on the quill spindle, I was able to go back to the fast flyer on my wheel and spin cotton with no trouble at all, whereas I struggled with a little bit before. So it, it kind of gave me the room to get the feel in my hand without the wheel yanking the, the cotton out of my hand. So this is a, it's a short seminar. I think this is one of the 90 minutes. And so we're really just going to be looking about at the tool and how to manage the wheel so we can do that reversal and we can do the winding on and spiraling up to the tip and getting out at the right angle so that your yarn is spinning instead of falling off the spindle and um, so it's all going to be about a technique and maybe a couple of different drafting methods i'll bring the fiber i'll bring wool i'll bring cotton for us to, to try out for you could get the hang of it uh, what you need to have in order to do the class is a wheel that has a driven spindle on it, like mine. Um, it's it's kind of like a support spindle that's just been turned on its side and has a drive band added to it. Um, your experience level, you need to be able to spin a basic yarn. And if you can spin a yarn, no judgment about how good you think it is. If you can just make a continuous yarn and you can break it if or you can join it if it breaks then we'll take care of the smoothing things out and that's i think going to pretty much take up our time for the for the seminar is just getting getting it into our hands and getting it into our feet and, and enjoying that rhythm of spinning on the quill spindle now i'm a fiber heathen 
and I know nothing about spinning. I know little about spinning. So you may have just said this, but I want to make sure people understand because earlier people were talking about all the different wheels they can use, like an e-spinner and all that. Are all of those applicable? Is there something pretty, this looks pretty specific. Well, not all brands of wheel have a quill spindle available to them. This one is an Ashford. I know it does. I know Magicraft does. I think maybe Jensen does, but don't quote me on that. Um, somebody did contact me asking about an e-spinner, and I can tell you that I don't spin on an e-spinner, but if you want to learn to do it, bring it along and we'll make it work. So if somebody needed to rent a wheel, they should ask for a um, Ashford they should make sure that they have one that has got the quill spindle available with it okay. because most most wheels aren't going to come with it they're going to come with the flyer and bobbin okay and if, you decide and if somebody to... if somebody i'm sorry if somebody's bringing their their wheel they should make sure either contact their manufacturer or whatever right make sure with that you've got the quill spindle and somehow i suspect some of those wonderful convergence vendors will may, may have one of these oh i hadn't mm -hmm. thought of that that's a great idea. <laughs> Don't bank on it, you know, because there Good might be a there, run Angela on them. Show. Yeah, because they are. All the vendors will be there. And um, Ashford will be there and um, Shacked and all the vendors will be there. So they, they probably will. And you might want to even contact them before you go and say, hey, I want this before your class. So. Yeah, bring it. Bring it to them. I'd love to do it myself, but I'm not signed up as a vendor. So we'll let the vendors take care of that for there you. There you go. And this, and this is, this is just... <laughs> Your class is what, for me, is what Convergence is all about. It's the opportunity to try something new and yeah, have somebody there hold your hand through it. So this, and this is a little bit of a specialty thing. And it's uh, and it's you're not going to be able to tell the difference in the finished yarn. We'll look at a couple of different drafting techniques, but it'll be might be the tool you want to try some of those, you know, nice colored top techniques on. There you go. Thank you so much, Angela. And again, you, if you're Kathy. interested in Angela's class or any of the class, go to our website and you can see the information in the registration book. If you want to contact the teacher and learn more, you can. And this was Quill Spindle Spinning 90 Minute Seminar, and it is Saturday, July 16th. Thank you again, Angela. If you want to register, please go to wespindie.org slash sessions. It's underneath the convergence uh, tab. You'll learn all you can about the class there. You can see when it is. You can see the uh, um, materials list for any class. If you're not sure you have the right material, do you have the right spindle? Uh, you can find out online about any of your classes about the material list there. We have some hotel information. People have been calling. Uh, the Crown Plaza Knoxville has been added, the Hyatt Place is on their Cumberland House in Knoxville. Uh, there are some rooms, not many, left in the Marriott Knoxville. If you, oh, and the other thing is someone called me the other day, be sure you go through the website and use the link. If you call straight to the hotel, they may not be able to give you the discount for the Convergence uh, Conference. So be sure you go through the website and you use the link. I hope you'll join us July 15th through the 21st. We're going to be in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, if you're interested in anything about the Appalachia weaving, this is the conference for you. We've got wonderful classes. Again, if you need more information, please go to weavespindie.org. We'll see you in July. <music>